cool. Can you guys hear me on Zoom? Awesome. So sorry for being late. Um, let's get this going. So uh, I, I I posted a few more grades. I finished grading. I finished handling regrade requests. Um, so check those if you haven't already. Uh, I have not gotten to project two, unfortunately. Um, so I'll, I'll get to that kind of this week. Um, we're almost done grading homework three. Um, so that should also be done this week. If you want to know how to get me to grade things faster, the best way is uh, don't do anything that would be approximating or anywhere close to uh, cheating because that wastes my time and a lot of it. And I have been dealing with that most of the weekend. So just, you know, if nobody's cheating, then I get my grades in faster and you're happier and I'm happier. So, you know, just just a thought. Uh, where did we end? I think we were around here. Okay, so we were talking about SIMD last time, and SIMD is just um, a type of parallelism. Uh, we've already seen with pipelining that we can parallelize the individual parts of our computation. So we have our load phase, our, our, our register read phase, et cetera. Um, what SIMD gives us is kind of the ability to do multiple operations. So this is instruction level parallelism. Um, and uh, we, we've seen both array processors and vector processors. The idea of both of these is again, we're, we're, we're operating on a collection of data rather than a single element, um, but they're a little bit different. Um, array processors kind of we have multiple parallel pipelines, more or less, um, whereas vector processors, um, each different instruction is kind of in uh, in a sort of pipeline. We have a, we set up a, an instruction pipeline. Um, this is, I think I last time might have confused some people, and I, I realized this after the fact, uh, by comparing this to pipelining that we've seen before. So it, it is similar in the sense that um, we are sending data from the various uh, compo uh, components through our, our pipeline here, but the pipeline is of instruction, not of like, you know, load, register read, et cetera. So this is like uh, an entire however many stages that it, it takes to do a load instruction. Um, this one's, you know, uh, a button a full add, uh, this one's a full multiply. Now, um, what they do share is there you're gonna load this entire set of instructions as, as sort of one um, one instruction, if you will. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of uh, be able to avoid having to do decode stages on each one of these things and stuff like that. Uh, but that is the concept here. So I'm not sure why my thing isn't working. Let's try again. There we go. So we have our vector um, processors and these ones, we kind of have a, uh, an instruction that contains multiple instructions. So that's this, this pipeline that we see. Um, and then it tells the various execution uh, um, uh, elements to do that, that instruction on a, a set of data. 
Um, contrast this to um, the, the more array processing idea where we have a single instruction that we're sending to all of our different execution units and they're just operating on different parts of our, our vector. So these are two ways that you might see this happen. Okay. Um, I think we covered this one, right? I think so. I'll, I'll cover it again. So the the idea here, we we have a an array of data. We want to process it, and we have a few different things that we need to be able to do. We need to be able to load everything in. We need to know how much of the data there is. Um, we need to also be able to specify how far apart the various data elements that we're going to process are from one another, and that's uh, each one of these are controlled by the uh, are accommodated by vector registers, then the vector length register and the stride register, respectively. Um, okay, so here's just a little bit more details on on how this is working. Again, um, we're performing the uh, the operation on each element in consecutive cycles. And as I mentioned, the functional units, the vector functional units are pipelines. And each stage of our pipeline is going to be operating on a different part of our data. So um, much like how in uh, sub instruction pipelining, so uh, the pipelining we've already seen, we're operating on different instructions at different points in our pipeline. Here, we're operating on different data elements in different parts of our pipeline. Um, and I mentioned this as well. We're, we're able to have deeper pipelines because there's no, no control flow. So we don't have any branch misses. Um, if we ever, you know, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, we also don't have any inter dependencies um, between um, vector elements. And we also know the stride. Um, so we can prefetch effectively. OK. There we go. So there are a lot of advantages to this. Um, I already mentioned just in the previous slide, we have no dependencies within a vector. So pipelining, parallelization, all is going to be great, deep pipelines. Um, and each instruction is going to do a lot of stuff. It's going to generate a lot of work. In the example that I showed, there, it's going to do four instructions kind of in one instruction. Um, so we can, we, that's just a single instruction, more or less. It's a, it's a wide instruction. but we can just fetch a single one and it'll do a lot of things. Um, again, we have this highly regular memory access pattern. Prefetching works really well. And we'll also see that we can do a lot of interleaving. Uh, so all the stuff with main memory that we've seen before, we can kind of take use that to our advantage, put stuff across a bunch of different banks to help optimize that. Um, And the other thing is these vector instructions um, kind of are implicit loops, right? Because you're telling it, hey, operate on this set of n elements. So you don't have a bunch of jumps with control flow that you have to go, OK, go back to the beginning of the loop and then keep doing the same operation over and over. So let's, um, oh. First, a couple of disadvantages. Um, this only works if our data is regular. So if we have a, basically, if we just have an array, 
um, if we have something that's more random, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Uh, and for example, searching for a key in the linked list, yeah, that's not going to be, you know, there, there's so many uh, variations in that, right? You might get a cache miss in the middle of it. You might uh, have a bunch of different branches, right? So there's there's all sorts of problems with with that. So there are disadvantages. You have to. It's only applicable to a certain set of situations. Another thing that we have to keep in mind is that memory bandwidth becomes a problem. Because we're fetching one instruction and then telling it to operate on a bunch of data, we have to get that data into the processor. And that takes time, as we've seen uh, in the previous few lectures with main memory, main memory is slow. Um, so what we want to do is we want to try and maintain some balance between compute, so the actual uh, work on the CPU of doing whatever computations we need to do, with the um, memory bandwidth requirement. Uh, and Obviously, one thing that can uh, that can help this whole situation is if we are smart about how we interleave our banks and such, and that's going to be um, something that we'll look at a little bit as well. All right, any questions before we continue? So. Let's look at the various registers that uh, we might, that we'll encounter. The first one is the data register. So it's going to hold n m bit values. So m is the, the size of our data elements, n is the number of data elements we have. And then we have a bunch of vector control registers. So the length register, which tells us how long the uh, the vector is the stride register, which tells us how far apart the various elements that we need to process are, and then the the mask. So we'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, in more depth. But the idea of the mask is is it tells us which op which elements we actually want to operate on. Um, so this will be useful if we need to do some logic inside of our, our pipeline. So we'll just say, uh, uh, we'll set the mask to zero and that will indicate, hey, don't actually do this computation or at least don't commit it to the register. Um, and the, the VLAN register, the idea here is it, it can tell us um, that there's like only part of your uh, register, uh, your data register is filled up. So that's kind of indicating, hey, don't process after this. Okay. So let's take a look at, a, at an example. Here we have a really pretty deep pipeline. This is a six stage multiply pipeline. So this is you know, a lot of stages, but again, we don't ever have to worry about some branch misprediction or something like that. We always are going to uh, do this regardless. Now, um, we can also pretty easily uh, um, deal with like, um, there, there's no interdependencies between our vector elements, so we won't ever have to do any bypassing or anything along those lines, which is really nice. It's a, just a kind of one directional. We just go straight into our pipeline. It does all of its stuff and sends it back into our destination register. In this case, V3, um, where we're multiplying V1 and V2. That's the idea. Okay. The other thing is, even though the pipeline's deep, you know, we can kind of make the cycle shorter because they're doing less. 
they're a lot more efficient as far as uh, what they're uh, each each oh shoot each stage of this pipeline is doing. You know, this one um, isn't. We don't have to worry about the latency of having to deal with our branch predictors or anything along those lines. So we can compress our uh, and, and none of the like crazy control stuff either. Uh, we can compress all of those um, down and make the clock faster in this part of our um, uh, execution pipeline. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this. You can read about it uh, yourself. So here's what I was talking about with memory. Um, as we recall from a couple, I guess last week, week, two weeks ago, something like that. Um, our memory is divided into banks. Obviously, it's it's divided into more than just banks. We have uh, ranks and and modules and such as well. But um, we can we can sort of just conceptualize it as a as a bunch of banks as well. And each one can be accessed independently, right? They share address and data buses, but we can access them um, like if we, for example, access bank zero, then one, then two, et cetera, all the way down to 15, that can kind of hide our latency. Um, and we can effectively sustain n parallel accesses if they go to different banks. They may be slightly offset, but, but more or less we can ma maintain uh, this this uh, fairly wide interface and ability to, to pull in data into our CPU, which is always a good thing. Here's an example. So if we have a bunch of memory banks, in this case, we have 16, zero through F. And whenever we want to um, pull in some data, if we're pulling different parts of our vector from different parts of uh, different memory banks, that's going to be advantageous. We're going to be able to uh, fairly effectively parallelize this and get um, a pretty good bandwidth into our registers. Now, we also need some, th some logic around the stride. And this is where uh, this stride register comes in. It tells us, hey, you were going to fetch this address. And then we need to go on uh, some fixed amount of memory further on and then fetch that bit of memory. So um, the stride in this case is just telling us, hey, skip over you know, 10 bytes or 16 bytes or, or whatever, whatever number um, is necessary. OK, any questions? So let's look at a code example with scalar code. So scalar code is, is non-vector. So this is code that you might write now, having not. Uh, and then we'll look at how we can convert this to vector code where we don't have to, um, for example, have a bunch of uh, looping. So just this is the this is the pseudocode for this this uh, bit of um, MIPS. Uh, we're basically iterating from zero to 49. Um, and we're uh, adding A and B at I together and then dividing it by two and then sending it over into C of I. Okay. So this is just initializing all of our variables um, and kind of specifying our, our start addresses. Then down here, we have to load our um, R1. So we have to load in A. And then we also have to load in R2, which is B. 
So we've loaded in the two oper operands to our addition. Then we do the addition. And then uh, we do the division. We're, we're being fancy and just using binary uh, right shift because that's, that's equivalent since it's in base two. And then lastly, we store R7, um, which is where we, we put the result of the division. We store R7 back into R3, which is, which is whatever this, this C is. Now, as you can tell, like, you know, th there's a bit of extra stuff here of, oh, we're going to also auto increment these, um, these registers to the, to the next element, but, As you can see, we have a bunch of different uh, things that have to go on here, right? We're, we're doing some decrements and then also branching. And each time we're, we're having to loop, right? We're, we're spending an instruction just going back up to the start. And then we're also spending instructions on fetching um, and storing all of these elements, okay? So any questions on this code before we we move on. Anything that's confusing? So let's talk about its execution time a little bit more in depth. So if we have an in-order processor and we only have one bank, um, the first two loads of our pipeline aren't going to be able to be pipelined. So you notice these two loads, if we only have one bank, no ability to uh, pipeline this. Okay. So we're gonna incur both uh, on both of these a penalty of, of 11 cycles. So, you know, uh, that's, that's not great. Um, if we parallelize and have, um, 16 banks and we kind of store our uh, words in, in, di in different banks and consecutive banks, um, then we can pipeline our load. This helps um, and, and reduces the latency of these two instruction. And um, One thing that to, to keep in mind, I, this isn't, I, I haven't really, I'm not gonna really highlight this too much. Um, you, you kind of want your, um, so in, you want your number of banks to be offset from your memory access latency. So, you know, this, this 11 cycle memory access latency, um, we can guarantee that we'll be able to obscure it if we have more than 11 banks is kind of the idea. So if we have 16 banks, um, we're gonna be able to overlap our um, memory accesses uh, and we won't have to, for example, if we only had say eight banks, we would still have to, to stall potentially and wait for memory um, because we just don't have enough bank to saturate the data uh, uh, bus because we're, we're having to wait 11 cycles for each one of our operations. Okay. So let's look at what would happen if we vectorize this loop. So now um, we're going to get rid of our, our looping. Um, we're going to uh, convert everything to use vector registers and such. So let's look and see what this looks like. First of all, oh, oops. It's technically seven dynamic instructions. So before, because of the loop, we had a, a like 304 instructions. Now we've reduced the instruction count. However, obviously these are more complicated instructions. So it's not always 
it's not always guaranteed to be better performance. One key with this code is that each in each one of these um, iterations is independent of the other, right? So this only relies on a sub uh, a sub a of i, b of i, and c of i. It doesn't, for example, do something like a plus like a of i plus a of i minus one plus a of i plus two or something crazy like that. All we're doing is looking at elements sequentially. And because of this, we can parallelize it um, uh, and vectorize this code. So a few things to note. First of all, here's our vector length register. It's 50 long, right? We have this zero to 49 thing. So we know that there are 50 elements that we need to process. Our stride is one since we're just uh, going How do we determine that the improvement is 10 cycles per loop? Which, what are your, which slide, previous slide? Um, oh, so basically you're now only incurring kind of uh, one of these um, latencies. So your, your total latency for the bank access is like 13, I think, or 12. So, so you, you reduce it a bit here. Um, I, I did sort of skip out, slide past that intentionally since this isn't something that I'm wanting to highlight. I want to really emphasize more of this. this. Hello, there we go. Next slide, here we go. <laughs> um, more, than, more than the previous one. But this is a great question. Okay, so we've set up our register. So we know, okay, here's the amount of data that we need to process. Here's the stride at which our data exists. And then the next thing is um, we need to load our actual register with the data to, to use. So here we're saying vector load into our vector register zero. Um, and then A. So this is our A register or our A like array. And then we also do a vector load on B. So we're, we're loading in our, our data into these long registers. And then we go ahead and do a vector add this is going to add element-wise all of our elements in the vector. And then we're doing a vector shift right. So we're doing that a binary shift right um, by, by one bit from V2 and into V3. And then we just store that vector V3 back into the, the corresponding memory address. Okay, so this is the this is the idea, right? We're able to um, avoid having to ever deal with loop conditions. We can very very accurately predict how to prefetch, right? We we literally have the stride for the next uh, set of memory instructions. Um, so basically, over here is 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 kind of describing the uh, the memory latency. Um, and then the uh, execution latency of each one of these instructions. So while the, they are dynamic instructions, we're still, you know, each one of the instructions is fairly long. But like I said, we're, we've totally gotten rid of control flow. We've totally gotten rid of branch, uh, uh, both branch prediction, you know, cache misses are gone. So lots of advantages to this approach. Okay, any questions? And we'll talk about how to deal with if statements. So how do we deal with conditions in our, in our loop? What if we had, instead of the nice 
nice one above where everything always executes. What if we have something like this, where if uh, a of i does not equal zero, then we do some multiplication, okay? Now, this is not something that you can just know, right? Before, before you actually load the data. So we have to have this as part of our pipeline, or at least as part of something in, in, our, in our process of executing this vector instruction. And the key is that we're going to use this, this mask register, this vmask register, um, which will determine which elements should be acted upon. So let's just take, an take this example above and, and translate it. We load A and B into their corresponding registers. And then down here, what we're going to do is we're going to set our VMask according to this condition. The condition is that V0 does not equal zero. So it'll go through all of our elements in our, in our vector, do this comparison, and see, OK, is, is, uh, is the first element equal or not equal, to, uh, not equal to zero? If so, then we will we'll set it, its flag to, to one which means that we want to actually go ahead and, and proceed with that um, instruction. And then we can go ahead and just do the actual vector multiplication and then store it back here. Hopefully this looks a little bit familiar because it's essentially predicated execution, but like more fancy. So we have this register that tells us more or less should we or should we not go forward with this um, instruction, which is a little bit different than predicated execution? Predicated execution, right? We have we have the condition inside of our instruction. This one's kind of external, but the concept is the same. We're going ahead and doing the same computation across the entire thing, and then we're selecting which ones we actually want to write back. And um, you know. One concern that you might have is like, what happens if like our your V mask is pretty much all don't commit, and like you have two or three things that you actually want to to commit? You know, that's that's a problem, right? Um, that you would have to to consider, and you know, in those cases, it may be better to to use a different approach, right? You're doing a bunch of computations on all your vector, and then only committing, you know a subset of them, that's not great. Um, so there's always trade-offs to, to, uh, uh, to this, but um, if you only have to ignore two or three elements in a 50 element array or something like that, I think that becomes much more worth it. So here's an example of kind of how, how this mask would work. So we have a loop that goes from zero to 64. And we, um, if a, a, a of i is greater than or equal to b of i, then we do this operation where we say, um, that c is is equal to c of i is equal to a of i. Otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna pull b of i. This is basically just doing a a um, element wise max function across our vector. And what we'll do is we'll we'll compare a and b to get our mask. We'll set the mask. Um. um then we, we have to also take a complement and that will tell us which ones we actually want to. Um, uh, so, so the complement kind of tells us which ones we want to um, do this second operation on. The, the, the normal comparison of A and B tells us which ones we want to do 
this first operation on. So after we've compared A and B, we can get the, gotten the first V mass. That's when we want to do the mass store of A into C. So we do this operation where C of I equals A of I. And then we complement it. That gives us basically all the other ones where we want to do the other operation where we store B into C. So here we've compared A and B. A is not greater than B, so V mass is zero. And th then when we actually go ahead and do this first masked store of A into C, the V mass will be zero. So it won't actually happen. It'll just ignore that and not change anything. Uh, so this one, they are equal. The, the V mask would be true for this element. So when we do the mask store, it will actually commit that, and it'll it'll write, uh, in this case, two into into our C register at that location. Um, and then you know I'll, I'll, you can kind of see how that works for all the other ones. When we reverse it on the step three, when we complement the V mask. Uh, now this becomes a one and we'll go ahead and run the second instruction where we store vector B into C and it'll be one. So it'll actually write this two. Okay, any questions? Oops, didn't mean to do that. All right, um, so how, how does this sort of work? So there's, there's a few different ways of, of going about implementing this. The easiest way is just always execute everything, right? We, we have our, let's just say our, we have N operations and we just sort of, uh, send them through the entire pipeline. And then at the very end, I don't know if you guys can see this, but oh dear. We, we just look at our mask and see if, if, uh, if that is uh, meant to be written or not. And if it is, then we actually you know, write it. If it isn't, then we don't write it. Um, and you, know, you can kind of see these ones all have, um, we're, we're sending every single one of our data elements, even if the bit is zero. Okay, so this is one way. Another way is you, which maybe is a bit smarter and avoid some unnecessary computations is we go ahead and scan the mass vector and then only execute those elements for which it's one. So we, we only would execute um, you know, A of one, B of one, C of one. Uh, and, and either way is, you know, accomplishes the same thing. Obviously this one is slower, um, at least in the execution state, but it, it does take additional logic um, to be able to scan the mass vector and, 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 and send the correct data through. Um, you know, the nice thing is, again, you don't have to worry about branches. It's still defined which ones you're going to execute, but you, you still need extra logic. So, in, so when would it be better to use a simple implementation? Um, Generally, probably not very often you would want to use this. Um, I can I can think of like you know there are some cases where maybe you know scanning this is is too expensive or or you're or for example if you're almost always one like if if it's like maybe you get a zero every one in a hundred or something then the additional latency of having to figure out which ones to load in and which ones not to load in and send through your pipeline, that might not be worth it to just save one 
of one of these over here. So that would that would be one example. Um, and to your point of like, uh, so yes, in each situation we do have to check eventually this mask bit. But for this implementation, it's very easy. We can just always compare, for example, like the, the you know, uh, one bit. And we can just kind of iterate through and, and keep track of which bit we're looking at. So it's, it's very, a very simple implement, implementation on that front. This one obviously is, a, you know, a bit more complicated. Great question, by the way. So, just a summary, and then we'll move on to the next topic. Um, our, our vector and SIMD processors are really, really good at exploiting this, this uh, data level parallelism. They do it by operating on many, uh, uh, doing the same operation on many different elements. So we're doing it vector wise rather than individual elements. Um, we can improve performance. We can simplify a lot of stuff um, because we don't have an intra vector uh, uh, dependencies and no control flow as well. So all of that branch predictor stuff, yeah, that can go out the window, at least for this part of the, you know, for the vector instruction. Unfortunately, obviously, this is um, we have some limitations that we've already seen. Um, if we have a bunch of scalar op operations, if we have a bunch of things that cannot be vectorized, those are not, you know, those are going to bottleneck performance. Um, and by Amdahl's law, that's going to also, you know, if we can't optimize that part of the, the code, that's, you know, going to limit the amount of speed up we can get from this these some d instructions mm, pretty much every single modern isa has some d instructions um, because they're they're useful for certain workloads and um, even if like so, so there's um, on normal CPUs, maybe you only have a few vector processing units, whereas maybe if you want a more specialized processor like a GPU, well, over there, you're going to have pretty much only these um, uh, SIMD operations supported. So these are just a few um, uh, things to think about. Um, any questions before we move to? The next topic. So we're going to now switch gears to another parallelism that we can exploit. So what we've seen is we've seen pipelining uh, at the, you know, the different execution stages where we have load, register, read, execute, um, uh, memory, write back, right? So that's a parallelism. parallelism where we're doing uh, different instructions in parallel. We just finished up SIMD where we're operating on different data elements. Uh, so we have data level parallelism. And now what we're going to talk about is multiprocessors, which is going to give us a new kind of parallelism, which is task parallelism. Um, parallelism, right, it's just anytime we do multiple things at once. So we've seen this, we've seen this, we're going to look at this today and tomorrow and maybe next week. Obviously, the, the main goal of any parallelism is that we want to, to improve performance. Um, either 
by improving the execution total execution time or improving it, our task throughput either way but um we're always going to have to adhere to Amdahl's law like we're uh we're going to harken back to like lecture three or something and remember have to remember oh yeah there's this parallel speed up limit right this is going to be important to consider there's some other goals though um uh for example we can reduce power by sort of making our cores smaller um if we have a bunch of units operating at uh if we have four units operating at frequency over four instead of um oh sorry four n units operating at frequency over four rather than n units at frequency f we're, we're going to actually get for power consume less power because um this as we saw the frequency is um related to power in, in super linearly it's worse than linear it's squared or, or sometimes even closer to cubic uh relationship there so uh as we go down that curve we're going to see more than just the the linear improvement in power consumption that we would maybe naively expect Another thing is, um, so, and this is really why in the past, in the past, you know, decade and a half to two decades, we've seen an explosion in multi core processors. It's that we've gotten to a point where it's just too hard to make single core processors perform as well as just as multi core ones, right? You can do all the craziness in the world and add these new SIMD instructions and add these new crazy ml instructions i don't know what i don't know what things have these days you know um but at the end of the day if you run into a branch that you mispredict well that all goes out the window for example so so you know you can have all this complexity but you're going to run up against stuff like branch prediction cache misses and and the like additionally as we talked about a long time ago at the beginning of the class, we're running into the boundary of frequency increases. So we can't really just bump the frequency anymore to gain performance. Um, so it's really becoming harder and harder and harder to actually make a single core that performs better than a, a previous generation single core processor. Um, so if you can't make one core faster how about just make two of them or four of them or eight of them or 64 of them if you're amd threadripper actually i think it's only 32 and it's like hyper threaded but same idea okay i'll quickly review this we, we've talked about um Instruction level parallelism, where we do uh, pipelining out of order execution, is another example of this sort of instruction level parallelism idea. Um, and again, it's that we, with all parallelism, we're trying to do different things in parallel. In this case, the thing is executing an instruction. Um, we didn't talk about this, but data flow is another example where we had those instructions that sort of define their dependencies. Data parallelism is what we just finished talking about with SIMD instructions and GPUs are also a prime example of, um, of this. Oh, and, um, I will post these slides tonight. Sorry, I didn't do that before class. What we're going to see um, now is that we also can have task parallel task level parallelism. And this is where we're doing separate tasks 
which are on separate threads, and we're doing those in parallel. So this is either, you know, uh, on a single core doing multiple things in parallel, or in a multi-core processor with multiple processors. You know, then, then we're we're able to uh, separate these these tasks um, up in, in various different ways. There's, and this is, you know, we're only going to touch the surface of parallelizing tasks. There, there's a lot of things that go into this, uh, but we're just going to touch the surface and focus on the sort of architectural aspect of it. OK, so let, let's talk about actually creating these tasks just a bit, though. Um, So fundamentally, we have to take our problem and split it up into pieces that can hopefully be done in parallel. Parallelizing things is easy if you don't care about performance. But if you do care about performance, which you probably do, then it's hard. And you actually have to you know, use your brain either um, you know, if you're a programmer, and, and doing this all explicitly with various, you know, pthread or whatever like that. Um, obviously, you're going to have to put in a lot of work to make this uh, multi-threadable in a way that is actually advantageous. Uh, sometimes your compiler can help. Sometimes you can tell the compiler, "Hey, um, <clears throat> uh, vectorize," or maybe it even does it automatically. Um, maybe you can use some compiler additions which which do parallel for loops or something like that there's there are some ways that the the, the compiler can potentially help um, but at the end of the day somebody had to you know take the time to figure out how to parallelize these tasks and um, you know you could take for example a program that has zero ability to be parallelized and put it across four different cores. You know, you do the first fourth of it on one core, first second fourth of it on another core, etc. But that doesn't help you, right? You always want to find that bit of the code that you can actually distribute across all four cores at once and do something useful. Um, so. Once we've um, partitioned these, these, this problem into a bunch of different tasks, then we actually have to run them in parallel. Um, one example at kind of an operating system level is just that we have a bunch of different programs running at once in different processes. So that's going to just automatically be parallel more. Uh, and we can use that for a lot of different things. A lot of cloud computing workloads do this where, and even sometimes they're not even on the same machine, right? You might have your database on one machine and your server on another one. So you're doing things in parallel. Um, you're doing tasks in parallel, um, but it's you know even across multiple different machines. Um, you know, obviously different users also create different processes as well. The problem is this is still not going to be, you know, we're still not improving single process performance. Most likely we we're actually hurting. If we're, you know, a, a couple months ago, my server was on a, I host on Linode, hosted on Linode, and the physical machine that it was on was getting pegged. It was just like CPU was like through the roof. And my, my VPS was like really slow and I was really confused. Um, but it was just because, you know, some other um, user on that box was hogging memory or disk, or maybe something that was just faulty, who knows. Um, but even though it's easy to, to run a bunch of different processes, that doesn't mean that you're going to get any performance increase from it at a single task level, that is. So let's talk about a few key um, 
types, key, key things with, with multiprocessor. Um, and the first is what is available to us. We have two different types of multiprocessors, loosely coupled and tightly coupled multiprocessors. So loosely coupled, the reason why it's called loosely coupled is because we don't share global memory address space. Um, each of the multiprocessors has its own memory and you can't share that memory with another uh, um, uh, of your processors. An example of this is if you have a, a sort of a networked cluster where you are um, using message passing, maybe it's JSON, maybe it's protobus or whatever message passing uh, mechanism you want. And this is, um, there are some advantages to this, obviously. The, the big advantage is because you don't have a shared memory ad, ad, address space, you don't have to worry about consistency across different machines uh, in their caches, for example. Um, but it also requires your brain to work harder because you have to figure out where is the data coming from? Do I have to send a JSON request over to that server or this server? There's a lot of things that go into to this uh, loosely coupled multiprocessor um, concept. But it's it's pretty it's this is basically the the foundation of stuff like Kubernetes and and the like. Um, The other one is tightly coupled multiprocessors. This is where we do share a global memory address space. So um, all of the cores can access the same memory. This is gonna cause some issues, which we'll talk about at the end of this class with synchronization between caches, for example. Um, whereas up here, you know, you, you still need to make sure that you let other processors know that things have changed in your state potentially you know it, it's more expected that that will, that will be the case whereas uh in these tightly coupled multiprocessors um the programmer is relying on basically an abstraction where memory is free and always takes one cycle and there's no cache. Um, so that, that puts the onus on computer architects to actually create those abstractions to create that illusion that that's the case. case. Um, this is probably sort of what pe people think of when they think of multiprocessors. In, uh, today right you have multi-core you have your eight cores in your phone for some reason um we have our hyper-threaded cores uh on various uh, consumer grade cpus this is what you generally think of um so yeah these are the two things that we um can use we're going to focus though on this tightly coupled one because that's honestly the more um architecturally interesting one right loosely coupled well we just let the programmer handle all the complexity okay so let's talk about the issues that we're going to have to solve first of all um shared memory has to be synchronized so we're going to have to do stuff like locks yes question here uh no okay so what is shared memory so shared shared memory is um if you have two different processes on a tightly coupled multiprocessor machine if they both access memory address one it's referring to the same location in, in ram like a physical ram uh stick so it does, this isn't related to virtual or physical at all. It's it's referred it's referring to 
what happens if this process, you know, wants to access a certain um, memory location? Now, obviously, you know, th there's virtual memory translations, but there is a conceivable way that two processes could potentially access the same bit of memory. And so that's, that's what it means to be shared. In a, in a loosely coupled environment, um, that's not the case, right? They're on separate machines. You know, there's no way that you could access across, across the network. Well, there is, but let's, let's not think too hard about, about that. <laughs> it requires more work than just the architectural level side of things. Yes, question here as well. This is memory as in RAM, but could um, loosely coupled have shared like hard disk space? Could loosely coupled have shared hard disk space? So, yes and no. Um, I, I would kind of, I would kind of separate out like your sort of paging to disk, that sort of usage of, of disk um, from data. So, you know, a lot of times in these sort of loosely coupled situations, you might have a, a file server or something, which is your, your, your main source for data. So, you know, they could totally share that resource. Um, but they aren't going to be sharing um, pages from from memory going out to disk and coming back in. That that's not going to be shared. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. Yeah. Great questions. Any other questions? Okay. So these, these locks and atomic operations, this is going to be really useful to make sure that um, we don't do stuff like try and access the same memory address uh, and write to it and have a race condition across multiple threads. Now, we also have some problems with cache. Each processor is gonna have its own cache um, and so we could have multiple different places where we're caching the same bit of shared memory. And so if we update one, we say do a write, we need to make sure that everywhere else that that is cached, it also gets updated or at least gets invalidated. So it'll be pulled. Um, and, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, uh, and then after after this this lecture uh, slide deck um, we also have to again provide this abstraction that everything's instantaneous to the programmer and so we're going to have to worry about memory operations ordering um, there's all all sorts of other stuff that we're going to have to worry about as well uh, we aren't going to concentrate as much on these, but we're going to have resource contention. We're going to have to do stuff like partition our data across. Maybe if we have two processes, maybe you want to put them on two different channels, for example. Maybe you want to put them across different banks. There's all sorts of different ways that you can partition your data. <clears throat> um, we probably won't touch too much on this, but we're going to have to have some bus to move data between processors um, to tell them, hey, I invalidated this cache line, for example. Uh, and then another thing that we're going to have to worry about is, is load imbalance. Um, this is kind of, you know, maybe you have, you're able to split up your program into four different parts, but one of them is like really intense and requires a lot of com compute power. The other ones are really easy. And they're going to be done like in a minute, and the other one's going to be done an hour later. So this is something that we also have to kind of consider with tightly coupled multiprocessors. Okay, so let's talk about parallel speed up um, and kind of remember back to Amdahl's law. 
okay, so let's let's play with this toy example. This isn't a you know this isn't a real program, obviously. And our assumptions are that each operation takes a cycle. So already this assumption isn't a great assumption, but we'll just go with it. Um, let's just say that we have no communication costs. Also bad assumption, but we'll go with it again just for the illustration. And then each operation can be executed on a different processor. So we're actually going to be able to do an add on this one and then a multiply over here. So again, not a great um, uh, approximation, but you know, if for example these were fairly long instruction, uh, long operations instead of just an addition, then this would make more sense. Um, is exponentiation exponentiation one off or n off, or n is the exponent? We're just going to say, well, we're going to just rely on multiplication. So we'll just use use that instead of uh, instead of doing um, instead of doing exponentiation. Again, it's a toy example. Um, so the question is, how fast is this with a single processor? And then we'll also talk about how fast is this with three processors. So Again, there's, we're, we're also not going to do any concurrent execution. We don't have any pipelining, none of that. So let's just take a look. As you can tell, later in the semester, and the more things that I have to deal with this that aren't lecture, the less good the lecture slides are. I kind of wanted to do this in 60, but then I realized that would take me like an hour. So I didn't. So here's the, oh, oops. Here's the idea, right? We, we sort of can construct an abstract syntax tree which defines how this computation will go. And then, you know, if we do one operation per cycle, we're just gonna, it's gonna take us 11 cycles. We do this, this one, and this one, this one, this one, kind of just work down our tree until it's totally evaluated. When we parallelize, then we're gonna be able to do some operations on different machines or different, uh, different cores. So we can do the multiplication of x times x over here on core one. On core two, we can be doing uh, a three times x. And then we can, we can pull over the x squared and multiply those together. And now we have ax cubed. And um, so what we'll find, and we'll, we'll go through this a little bit more in detail on Wednesday, uh, we'll find that you know, this will take five cycles now. So we've really improved the performance. But uh, you'll notice that five, you know, is not, is not one, right? Naively, if you're like, oh, we have a, you know, um, well, okay, first of all, if we had more than three processors, we would still have, you know, some, dependencies we wouldn't be able to do all the operations at once so you know we're going to see that the slowdown obviously is not uh, the speed up is not going to be the number of cores okay um sorry for keeping you a minute late i will let you uh go and i'll stick around for any more questions and i'll um i'll be at office hours in a few minutes all right have a good one thank you guys Hey, they so call it snow day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just had a quick question. Um, back on the main issues with tightly coupled multiprocessor slide, when you were talking about shared memory and um, the and yeah. when you had the student question that kind of went off tangential to that, um, are we going to be worrying about like shared memory and parallelization down to like the thread level? Or are we more talking about on the grand scope of two different processes in this class? Or are they kind of like abstract? We're going to kind of same? consider those as the same. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I can see that. I was just wondering. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that distinction is important for OS. Yeah, that's what I thought, but, especially since OS isn't a prereq for this class, that they might just go in two different directions. Right. And, you know, what we'll really talk about is, is more the architectural side of things. To support to support um, 
multi-core stuff rather than you know OS has a lot more stuff like how do we partition it how do we maintain the data structures necessary to to keep track of all this stuff which is you know it doesn't matter for this class so yeah not on our hardware level okay cool thank you so much okay have a good one you too